Hi, my name's Steve Boardman. I'm one of the pre-sales consultants at Hornbill. And today we're going to be taking a look at SupportWorks ITSM. Uh, this is based on version 3.6 of ITSM and on version 7.6.1 of the Enterprise Server Platform. Before we start looking at the application, I just want to uh, give you the basics of the background on in terms of what SupportWorks actually is. So the uh, ITSM Enterprise application provides with all the following ITIL uh, processes out of the box, uh, everything through for instant, through to uh, release, etc. everything in front of us. The platform itself, which the SupportWorks ITM Enterprise application sits on, uh, can also be used for other applications such as you know, HR facilities, but we're, to, we're not focusing on those today. We're specifically looking at the, uh, the ITSM application. The enterprise support platform itself takes care of all of the sort of stuff that perhaps you don't see uh, in the background. So um, the sending and receiving of emails, uh, the tools around uh, reporting, uh, your call management, notifications, pop-ups, etc. and under underlying library. In terms of sort of interacting and interfacing, um, in terms of getting data into, uh, into support works or into the platform and into the application, um, if we're looking at user uh, and maybe CI data, then we can pull that information in uh, using a data import utility or using uh, XML APIs. Um, again, we can see here that's uh, you know valid whether it's you know, for relational databases and discovery uh, solutions as well. And that's just a, a simple data mapping exercise and then scheduling that to run as required. On the right hand side here, we can see as well that there is a, a customer self service portal available with SupportWorks. And obviously, that we'll have a look at that as we go through this today. Um, and in terms of giving your, your users uh, the ability to, to log, update, uh, resolve their own tickets, um, search knowledge, access some reporting, uh, and also have visibility about the services they consume. From uh, an analyst or somebody providing support, there's a, a number of different interfaces available to you. There's a Windows, web, and mobile client, and we'll look at all three of those uh, during this presentation. Uh, and also SupportWorks uh, is available to you either as a, an on-prem uh, solution or it can be available uh, as a software as a service model as well. Um, and again, those options uh, are available to you and um, probably speak more to your relationship manager or, or uh, sales manager if you're interested in those different options. Okay, well, if we get started, uh, initially we're going to have a look at uh, SupportWorks from the context of um, somebody providing support and in this example we're actually logged in as an administrator so we've got the rights and permissions um, to do pretty much everything that we need to do for the demonstration uh, but we'll also have a look at the flip side of this um, from the self-service perspective uh, of someone that's being uh, supported so we can see both uh, both sides of the uh, of the picture so initially as I say I'm logged in um, as an administrator your um, your rights and permissions will be governed by your security profiles, which you can uh, sort of set up yourself, and that's going to take care of your system uh, privileges, uh, your application rights around all the areas that we sort of talked about in terms of instance problems, changes, and, and a variety of others, and also which mailboxes you have access to, both personal and, and shared. And again, that's all taken care of. And once you've got those profiles set up, it's a case of literally just dragging across um, or moving across the, the relevant uh, analysts into those uh, into those roles. Okay, but when we when we log in to SupportWorks as an analyst, the first view that we actually see is the SupportWorks Today uh, view, and this really gives us an overall picture of what's happening in your support environment. In this example here, we've got information being displayed uh, relating to the services that we offer. Um, it's entirely up to you whether a you're offering services, b whether they're visible, uh, and then of those services which you you do provide, which ones you want to make uh, or sort of promote up to the support works today page. So we can see here that one service is running okay, another is um, is impacted, and we'll drill down and look at that in a second. It's also a shared and common area where we can look at all the major instance problems, known errors that might be affecting um, the service desk, as well as a sort of a, a highlight reel of what's happening from a change perspective. It's not our change or full schedule of change calendar, but um, it gives you a feel for what, what uh, changes are ongoing or upcoming or even uh, overdue. Um, in our environment. As the logged in uh, analyst, I've also got visibility of any authorization decisions that are uh, awaiting my uh, review and decision. And at the bottom, we've got a sort of a first touch point on some, if you like, sort of global uh, KPIs around how the desk is performing. We'll look at role-based dashboards uh, when we get on to reporting towards the end. But this is really, if you take it in the context of what's happening with the, the desk as a whole, 
Um, and again, there's a variety of different metrics that are provided out of the box for you. But if we come right back up to the top here and we have a look at a couple of these examples. So within this service availability, we can see that the email service is actually experiencing problems. So I can drill down and have a look at the underlying service record from a sort of a technical perspective. We've also got a business view of this service as well. And we'll have a look at that from the self-service perspective for someone that is actually subscribed to and using or consuming the service. But initially, there's a lot of information around this service. We've obviously got the, 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 the standard sort of portfolio and lifecycle status. We've got business um, and IT ownership of that. We can build up and actually um, uh, reflect or graphically reflect the relationships between that, uh, that service and any under actually lying CIs in your CMDB. Um, and we can form operational relationships, which will allow us to start sort of modeling um, impact and such like when we start looking at change. Uh, specifically but so all of that is there um, it just needs to be uh, populated uh, on your particular instance um, when you get started okay some of the other information that's available to us here is you know are we interested in monitoring this service for availability well in this example we we certainly are uh, and we know that there's a, a current issue that's being experienced at the moment we can define the the hours against which this service is is run so we know about its operational um, outages as well as its overall outages we can set up um, event handling, and this event handling can both be manual in terms of degrading a service, but it can also take triggers from network monitoring uh, solutions, you know, your you know, SolarWinds um, and a variety of other, uh, Nagios, for example, tools that are firing off notifications, whether it be uh, an email notification, whether it be um, an API call, whatever that might be. We've got the uh, the tools to basically consume those notifications and then against a set of conditions that you would specify we can invoke automated actions which could be the automatic creation and logging of a ticket of a particular type routing it to the resolver team attributing it the correct sla um, and then maybe degrading or impacting the the service that's related to that particular uh, notification as well and again that's all all configurable within the ui for you okay coming back up though again um, the service allows us to actually cost and model actually what it takes to provide this service um, and then we can sort of cross charge out those costs if we so desire to people that are consuming that service. And we can do that um, differently to different consumers. Um, that could be, um, you know, subscribing individuals and charging them or not charging them, Sub um, subscribing a department or an organization as a whole to that service and maybe attributing different costs and different uh, uh, service level uh, agreements uh, against that particular service. We would have all the, um, the usual you'd expect, keeping some sort of sort of history of all the tickets that have been logged against that service, any knowledge that's relevant, uh, sort of an action or audit trail against that service, as well as any uh, effective business areas. So not necessarily somebody that owns the, the service or consumes the service, but uh, maybe a, a management team that are interested in, in the event that there's going to be a change relating to the service as well as any under, underpinning sort of third party contracts that might relate to this service as well. We can also set up preferred support um, options for the service. So when we're logging tickets against this service, what are the, uh, the priorities, the categories, any underlying uh, supporting processes that should automatically be invoked if this service is associated uh, to a ticket. And again, that's all available uh, there for you. OK, but coming back up to the, the top, um, we've looked at sort of what the services and the main components. We'll probably have a look at that more uh, in terms of uh, request fulfillment against those services that we offer uh, as we move forward. But in terms of sort of what we're looking at and the look and feel here, um, on the left hand side, we've really got our menu structure. And there's a lot of options. We'll cover most of these as we go through today, but um, access to our, our role based uh, uh, training engine and dashboards. The service desk view, which is where we're going to manage our tickets, um, where we might want to come in and graphically build our, our business processes, access to a change calendar, individual calendars, mail, uh, mail, maybe some search options, access to the CMDB for, for what we're looking for, searching for requests and various other reporting and knowledge base options are available to us. But initially, let's get started and actually have a look at what it looks like to, to log some uh, requests into the system. So depending on my rights and permissions when I come in, I, I may have the rights to raise instance problems, changes, you know, um, uh, change proposal or change request, whatever it might be. Uh, support works fully supports as well, sort of templated quick log calls, if you like. So rather than having to rekey the information time and time again, we can we can template those those requests uh, and we simply might just have to add in uh, who the caller was uh, and then we can log and resolve that in one function. But we'll take um, a classic example where we, uh, we've taken a phone call uh, and we need to log a, an instant uh, on behalf of the caller. So we bring up the instant form 
Um, and the first thing we want to do when we bring up this incident form is actually identify the, uh, the caller. And we might do that by their, their employee number, ID, their name, whatever that might be uh, to get us to that point. But on resolving their details, we're hopefully going to be pre-populating that form with information that's, that's pertinent and relevant to the reason why they're calling. So there's some sort of initial sort of contact information. Now this data will be um, pulled through from the SupportWorks database and the SupportWorks database will have been populated on a scheduled basis from you know, maybe Active Directory, maybe a HR system, maybe a spreadsheet or a combination of all three. But what we're doing here is actually looking at the SupportWorks database, not going off to a third party uh, database. It's given us information about the, uh, the caller, um, you know, how many active or, or closed calls they've got, soft touch uh, information as well, you know, are they, are they technical, non-technical, how should I be speaking to them? Uh, we might also have some information about how they've rated the service that they previously received from us. So overall, it's been it's been neutral, and that information is uh, is gleaned from um, Anna's record. So I so say we can look at Anna's uh, properties here. We can see at the bottom the feedback that she may have provided over a period of time against the instance uh, request for change, etc. That she's uh, logged with us, and that's all available to her, as well as any of the services that Anna's. Um, subscribe to, where she works, her job details, etc, etc. All of that's available in her individual record. But what's also brought through onto the form automatically for us in the bottom right hand corner are all the services and CIs that Anna either consumes or has a relationship to. So we can see here that um, she has access to internet and, and email. So there's two services that we offer to her. We can see those services are either available or faulty already. But she also um, potentially has a, a PC, a laptop, some applications. So again, what we're putting here is really the items that she's likely to be calling about. Now this is uh, definable. At the moment I've got it set to uh, show me it by customer, but it could be an example where you, you don't actually attribute um, CIs to users individually. You have a hot desking policy, something like that. So they might all just be site based, organization based. So we can filter the list uh, appropriately. And Anna, in that respect, can, can work at one or multiple sites within your organization as well. And we can filter the list to the particular site that she's at at the point that she's calling as well. So that's all available to you. But we'll take an example here, and it could be that actually Anna's calling about an issue with the, uh, the email service. So a number of things that can happen here automatically for us. One is that um, some preferred support assignment uh, options are automatically invoked so it could be that this should be routed to the infrastructure team but it's also telling us at the bottom that there might already be potential problems or known errors that are in the system that relate to this particular type of call based on the services that have been selected and the category that's been invoked automatically. So from the find solution I can actually have a look at the problem and known error database and I can see here that there is in fact um, a potential problem or known error that uh, may be relevant to this particular call. So from here, what I might want to do is actually have a look at the details of that particular problem and known error, see if it's relevant to what's being called about. Maybe there's some workaround information that's already accessible to me that will uh, resolve the issue for Anna and allow us to keep working. Uh, or alternatively, I could actually say, well, there's no useful information in terms of workaround now, but what I do want to do is actually link and associate this incident to that known error so that when subsequent updates or a workaround is provided, that that information will automatically cascade down to the child incident. But we won't uh, we won't associate it at this point. As uh, as we're working through this example, we'll actually um, we'll promote and create a new problem off the back of a, an incident instead. Okay, so if we take the information here, and it's called about an email issue, it could be that uh, uh, emails aren't coming through. So we just record the information in here. being received. We can see here that the category was automatically picked up both based on the uh, service that's been selected but there is um, a couple of nice features that sit behind here as well and these are uh, what we call operator scripts. So it allows you to predefine a set of decision tree based questions or prompts for your analysts that uh, they need to, to ask when we're receiving or taking calls of a particular type. So if we use this example here it could have been you know an MS Office related issue and we could have said well actually it was Outlook related and we're having problems sending and receiving, and we are collected to the LAN or whatever they might be, and then finish. What that allows us to do is an alternate way, and a quick and speedy and consistent way, is actually okay, prompt the, the analyst to ask those questions of the user, and then populate the questions and the answers onto the details of the, on the incident form automatically for us without us having to, to key that in. Um, obviously, you'll, you'll find what works for you best, and maybe a combination of the two is, uh, is an option for you. Other options that are available as well is, is attributing tight um, or shorter SLAs against services as opposed to the user. And if those exist, then the shorter SLA can uh, be invoked uh, at the time that the call has been logged and we've associated that service to the record as well.
But in this case, I think we've got all the information we need to, to log this in the system. Options at the top here, I could log, and that would automatically go to the preferred support assignment. I may actually manually want to do that and assign it away to uh, an individual or a team. And I can see here in the brackets how many tickets either the team or the individuals in the team have currently got. I can also see by um, the, the image, if you like, in, in blue that someone's logged in, or if they're not, uh, they'll be sort of more ghostly looking. I could also, if I wanted to, perhaps go looking for uh, an individual in a particular team who's got skills in a particular area, uh, and I may want to assign on that basis as well. So there's a number of different options that we can do that, as well as maybe doing a log and a first time resolution. But um, in this example, I'm going to log uh, and accept and, and work on this ticket myself. We're going to open the ticket details and we're going to send a confirmation email back to the requester. The email uh, templates that we're using are completely configurable. So obviously your own branding and your own choice in terms of the, uh, the text and any attributes or, or variables that are going to be pulled through from the ticket in terms of maybe the uh, reference ID, uh, whether you're bringing through the uh, information about the questions and answers that have been provided so far, any SLA expectations, that type of information and your, obviously your signatory you can pull through and add into that ticket. When that ticket is then logged and we're looking at the details, uh, any of the email communication, whether it's inbound or outbound, will automatically get attached uh, to the ticket. So there's no need to sort of cut and paste uh, within the solution at all. We'll have a look at as well as sort of generating tickets automatically from email as well, as well as another mechanism for getting uh, tickets into the system. But we'll, we'll come back to that um, in a second. When we're looking at working on tickets, there's a number of manual and automated options that we could choose here. So I could, from within the, uh, the toolbar at the top, I can assign the call. I could uh, update the call. And it may be that we want to record the different types of updates that are applying, you know, time spent, if that's important to us, when it's recorded, if those updates are going to be public to the customer of this particular request on self-service. Do we want to email the customer of every update that we apply? Um, and then we can come in and simply put the update in and we can we can come in and put, and put the text in um, or we might use um, a, a feature of SupportWorks which is um, sort of multi-clips which allows you to predefine commonly used strings of, of text so you don't have to keep rekeying them. But on here I've just said you know I've called this user and uh, they're not available but I'll apply that update into the system. All of the updates when they were applied and who applied them are automatically added into our call diary so we have a history of everything that's happened uh, within that call lifecycle. Um, just for audit purposes. But uh, other options that are available to us is obviously, you know, updates that we're applying is great and we can reassign and we can put it on hold and, and such like. But um, we may want to work in, a, in a, an environment where first line might take the ticket, work on it, get it to a particular stage. And if they're unable to progress it, they may do one of a, a number of things. One of those, which could be actually, well, I'll, I'll assign it away as a whole to another team, or I may want to keep ownership of that that ticket, but I might want to create uh, a task for someone else, either within my team or another team, um, to help out um, towards the resolution of this ticket. And we can create those, and we can create sort of operational tasks. And this could uh, be formalised. You know, we could have agreements between departments so that um, if if the first line have received an issue of a particular type which has an appropriate SLA assigned to it, in order for us to resolve that, if we need someone else's help, we may have internal OLAs in place to say, well, actually you need to respond by X, which will allow me to comply with the SLA back to the customer. But again, that's all entirely up to you as to what you use. So we'll take an example here and we'll, we'll push a task back to the development team. So this is really, again, just a demonstration that um, you need to make sure your OLAs sit with inside your, inside your SLAs or, or you're obviously naturally going to potentially breach those SLAs back to the customer, but just demonstrate that functionality is in place to warn you if that is such the case. We can categorize that task differently and give that task an example. A title, should I say. And we'll log that. What that will then do is give us a child ticket to the overall parent ticket, and that will be assigned off to the appropriate team. In this case, it's gone off to our, our release team, and it's gone off with particular uh, response and fix obligations that are directly attributed to that uh, OLA task that we've created. We could also, at this point, have been running a formal um, business process that would guide us through uh, the uh, creation of tasks automatically without me having to come in here, uh, sending, in, uh, sending a notification emails, changing of statuses, priorities, etc., based on conditions that have been met within that particular ticket. But in this example, we will uh, we'll keep that all manual. So just before we progress that ticket on further, we just want to come back and have a look at the options regarding uh, email. So 
SupportWorks comes uh, supplied with a, an email autoresponder utility. And what that allows us to do is actually to uh, to interrogate inbound emails that are coming into mailboxes that we're that we're monitoring. Um, and if we pass it past the autoresponder, the autoresponder can look for conditions such as um, content of the subject line, you know, particular words in particular positions. Uh, and if we get a match, then what we can do there is automatically create a ticket based off that condition being met. We can route that ticket to a, a specific team, uh, invoke a particular SLA, etc., and allow the, uh, that process to, to get rid of some of that triage, which is generally needed when emails um, emails are coming into a mailbox and um, it's someone's or a team's responsibility to manage a mailbox and look at that. But they, the autoresponder I would suggest would probably take care of you know a high percentage of those emails that are coming in but there's probably a requirement for someone still to pick up and, and look at a mailbox um, and look at the emails that are coming into that. Um, so if we take an example here we've, we've um, got this mailbox set up and I've got the rights to look at it and I can see emails that have been coming in and we can see there's one that's coming in from Alan here. Uh, it hasn't met any conditions, so um, it hasn't automatically created a job for us. But even when that is the case, the, the most manual or, or sort of involved I have to get with that is really looking at the, the content of the email and then really making a decision to say, well, actually, is this an incident service request, um, etc. And from there saying, OK, well, I want to promote this as an incident. Alan happens to be a VIP, so we're going to have that pop up presented to us. All the information that was um, on the email is automatically pulled out and put into the ticket for us. And any of the attachments that are on that email are automatically stripped out and added in as well into the file attachments in the same way as the ticket we were working on earlier. And then it's really just a case of saying it's related to this category of X and, and logging that into the system. So that's as managed as it gets. No cutting and pasting as I mentioned earlier. But anyway, we'll come back and um, have a look at the original email that we were working on. Sorry, original ticket that we were working on. Um, and we had this in the, if we recall, we had this in a position where we'd we logged it, um, ascertained the information that was pertinent. We looked at manual and automated ways or um, of, of progressing it, adding in tasks, etc., for third parties. But it could be if we sort of take a quick sort of if you like five or ten minute uh, ITIL journey here, it could be actually that off the back of this we need to do something further. It could be that we actually want to create a new problem or go straight to a, a change or a service request. But we'll, we'll take the problem example here. So on here we will promote from the incident, so the information relating or that's in the incident is automatically cascaded up and added as the prompt description and category. We may subsequently want to change that. The incident itself is added as um, an associated information. In the associated information is an associated incident for us automatically, and then it really comes on to us actually logging this problem and getting that into the system. So one of the things that I may want to do is actually look at you know what CI or service is potentially causing the issue that we're having here. So it could be that we go looking in our in our CMDB structure um, all the way down for a particular uh, CI or such like that we're looking for. We could do a uh, a general search, so I could search for all those and find the one that is interest to me. Or I may actually know um, what the idea of this one is, and I might want to do a search for a particular CI. So we can see here that I'm looking for an email server. I found that, and I'm going to associate that with this problem record. I may then want to attribute the appropriate um, SLA if it hasn't already been picked up. So we might have a problem management SLA that we're using. And it may be that we want to categorize this differently um, to how the incident was originally categorized. And we'll do all of that. At this point, in the same way as the incident, I'm going to, to log and accept. We won't look at the email because we've seen those already. So we'll just open up the bones of a, a problem record for us. So at the bottom, we can see there's obviously some more problem specific uh, fields and information available to us. You know, we're really probably working towards um, identifying what the root cause was, was and a preventative fix, but also providing a, a workaround which we can cascade down to any child instance that have been associated to this particular problem record. But if we look up at the right hand side here as well, we've probably got information available to us relating to how many customers and how many CIs or services are affected by this. So if you imagine over time as we have this problem record in the system and more incidents are being logged and being associated or I retrospectively go looking for incidents that might be um, might have resulted as a um, you know inadvertently of this problem and I can go and find and, and retrospectively associate those to the ticket this number of customers is going to or affected customers is going to increase and you can set rules and conditions when that, that number of affected customers gets to a particular tipping point or parameters where you can increase the the impact of this ticket and there potentially therefore the underlying priority um, and any underlying SLA that is attributed to that 
So we'll come back up here, um, um, just sort of jumping forward for time purposes. We could have done all our manual uh, updates as we would have done with an instant or any other uh, ticket type. We could have had an, an underlying business process to support this. But um, in this example, we'll just jump forward and say, right, we've, we've identified a, a workaround so um, that will re resolve this, this issue um, in the short term. So in this example, we might want to use um, a hot swap server. That might be our, our workaround. And by identifying that workaround, what we can do is, is publish that as a known error. So we can make choices now. Now, do we want to cascade that information down to the child instance? And if we do, leave this selected. And do we also want to let those instant owners know that there is a workaround available, which will allow their uh, affected customers to, uh, to resume work? So we'll make that decision. And that problem has now been published as a known error. We come back to the ticket and we can see the ticket number is still the same, but the uh, the problem has been moved into a known error state. Um, and it could be for, for one of the many reasons that these known errors never, never get resolved. It could be um, a known error with a legacy system. Uh, it could be financially in, uh, not viable to affect a, a permanent uh, fix to this. There could be a whole variety of uh, reasons why that's um, that would be the case. But if we take the example where we can manage um, a number of these known errors back into our estate through sort of formal change processes then we'll, we'll have a look at what that um, what that look and feels like so off the back of this known error we could raise uh, a new change and when we're looking sort of in the context of change we're doing that really with different uh, a number of different hats on at this stage um, I'm purely uh, raising a request for change it doesn't mean that I'm part of the change team or going to make a decision as to whether this change uh, should be approved um, or actually implement this change. I'm just the one that's going to provide the information which uh, will go to the change team for them to assess uh, and make their decisions uh, based on. So in order to do that we can actually support that process by um, ensuring that the people raising changes are doing it in a structured and a, and a formal way and we can support that in a number of different ways and that can be really through this sort of the, the collection of the, the data really. So we can uh, you know, we could simply say, okay, well, I want the person raising this change to, you know, give us their in, uh, interpretation of whether it's a high-low medium impact and whether it's a high-low medium risk level. Or we can actually go ahead and build our own um, impact and risk assessment criteria. So when this comes sort of out of the box, it's a blank canvas for you to come in and say, actually, well, these are the areas that I'd like to um, get the change requesters to assess against. Um, and I'd like to provide them with these options. Uh, and in the background, we'll create a scoring matrix. So based on the decisions or the options they choose here, that will then create a score. And as a result of that score, that's going to tell us, based on our business rules, in this case, what the overall impact uh, assessment should be. Um, and if there's any sort of lead times or such like that might be involved. We can do the same for risk, um, but in the same sort of uh, guy, so I'll, I'll leave that there. Um, but it may also be as the uh, requester of this change, so I'd like this change to, you know, I want, want to get it started straight away, and ideally I'd like it finished by the end of the week. Um, I may want to put some reasons, or I might know, the, you know, what sort of downtime we can expect. But as a requester, I wouldn't necessarily know that information at this stage. Uh, it could be that there are affected business areas that I might want to keep in the loop regarding to this change request. Um, and I can either manually go and add them or they could be automatically pulled through based on either the CR or the service that's associated to this change. And when we went from the problem to the change, because there was a CI associated to the problem, it automatically added that to the change. But I could subsequently go in, add additional items that I would like to be changed or remove that item if I didn't feel it was appropriate. So again, a lot of information that's um, available to me here. Yeah, I could specify the environment. You know, It could be whether it's your development or, or test environment this is going to be applied on. Um, and in the same way, we, we may have one or multiple um, processes we follow, depending on the type of change that's being requested. It could be an emergency change, an I-201, etc., etc. Uh, if I had chosen an emergency change, for example, here, we'll see that the required by isn't a mandatory field. And we know whether they're mandatory or not, because they'll be denoted with a, a red triangle in the top right-hand corner. But if I select ITIL change process here, we can see here now that that field now becomes mandatory. So really just demonstrating that either at the start or at any stage within a particular process, you can uh, define particular attributes, one of which is what, what fields are required. Um, is this, uh, uh, does this ticket get locked for a particular point? Do I have to uh, associate a CI to move forward? All of those type of options will be available for you through the, the business process engine. But I could put on here, okay, well, if it's required, um, I'd like it done you know, by maybe 
Tuesday of next week, something like that. So at that point, I'm then going to go ahead uh, and log this change into the system. Uh, we won't set an email because we've, we've seen those before. But then we're really in the um, in the throes of, uh, of looking at this from the, the change management team. So this ticket is going to be routed to the change team. Maybe the change assessor, change coordinator is now picking up this change and they're looking at all the information that's been uh, been provided. So they may be looking at uh, the option information, looking at the assessment criteria that's been uh, provided by the user they might come in and have a look at the the impact so we can see here actually that you know it's one ci that needs changing um, there's already one known error one instant to fix and, a, and, a, and one customer that's been um, affected we can see when they'd like this to to take place and obviously if any additional information has been provided regarding justifications or, or downtime for this but really at this stage all i'm doing is, is following the process that i've invoked here which is actually saying to the uh, the change assessor is this, is this change a, a major, minor, or a significant change? And again, these are completely configurable in terms of the, the underlying processes that you follow. But depending on which option you select in my example here, uh, if it was minor, it may have bypassed, it a cab, bypassed the cab entirely. If it was significant, it might go to one cab. And if it was major, it may go to another. So I'm going to select major in this example. And we can see here that the process has moved on and it's taken us through to a, a cab or authorization stage. So this kind of negates, if you like, the need to have those sort of formal uh, cab review meetings where everyone turns up for an hour and they go through a half a dozen changes. This allows you to have a sort of an e-cab where uh, members of that cab will get a, an email notification uh, and then they can come in depending on their role and, um, and make their authorization decision. Authorizers could be um, analysts in this example. They could be um, the customers affected by this particular ticket. They could be a CI owner, uh, a service technical or business owner. Um, or another customer uh, sort of generally in here as well. Uh, approvals can be unanimous or they could be weighted. In this example, we need to score 100 points in order, order to move it forward. And we can see here Keith has been attributed 80% um, or 80 points and the other two have got 25 each. So we need Keith plus one other to approve or reject it as the other two can't get the required numbers on their own. Now, uh, the analyst can make their decision via the Windows web or mobile client. Uh, supported customers can make a decision via self-service portal, uh, customer mobile, uh, or via email for, for the processes where you allow that. There's also the option where people can approve on other people's behalf if you give them the appropriate rights. Uh, and this will just uh, demonstrate that. So I could make that decision on behalf of Keith. We can see here that it will actually be audited and it was actioned by me on a particular date. And I could do the same for this user just for time purposes. We'll save that in. At the point that that is now authorized, the, the ticket moved forward within the, uh, the life of the process. We can see the progression through the process here. So we can see that it's now been authorized and there may be a multiple of, uh, of steps that still need to be followed, but I've got visualization of, of what's happened so far and what needs to happen next. In this example, it's gone through to a task stage and in that task stage, it's actually created uh, a number of um, concurrent tasks, the sort of typical things you would do uh, within a, a change uh, life cycle. Uh, these obviously don't have to be uh, concurrent. They could be sequential. They could be dependency based. They could be in completely uh, isolated and separate uh, stages of their own with gates to get in and out of those stages as well with the authorization options. It's entirely up to you how that uh, looks and feels. But um, this was really just to give you a flavor of, of some of the, the sort of typical tasks that you might uh, attribute out. So it could be you know you may attribute the, the, um, the task for someone to go and baseline the CI before this change is um, is, is applied. So we can here say, okay, well, I've successfully done that. It may be someone's responsibility to define the backout plan. And again, that backout plan may have needed signing off before we move forward to another stage. But that backout plan might have been simply summarized in the record. It could be held elsewhere. So it might just be referenced, or it may actually have been added physically as an attachment to this record as well. Again, those options are entirely up to you. Other options within that sort of uh, change lifecycle might be the creation of change activity. So um, it might be that we just schedule this whole change as, as, as a single item and it will be uh, deployed at a particular time. Or we might want to have change activity like, you know, pre-production testing, that type of thing that we want to schedule in um, against this ticket. So if we go to the, the change schedule and we have a look at adding activities and we'll use that example, um, pre-production testing and we might define that as a, a testing activity and we might look to do that um, across the next day or so 
And when we now go to schedule this activity into our forward scheduler change calendar, it's actually going to cross-reference a number of uh, elements of the system. And again, depending on how mature our CMDB is and if we're using availability and we're defining blackout periods, etc., against the CIs and services, this is going to come back and it's going to say, okay, well, this particular item is already involved in other changes. Um, or there's a blackout period, or this is during the operational hours for this particular item, or there's a blackout period specified, or there's already a number of ongoing activities at the same time that you're looking to uh, add this activity in. All sort of warnings that save you having to go off and looking and, and check with people in terms of what's going on. Um, this gives you uh, one view of, of all that information and all of those potential clashes um, so that you're aware of them. I can still uh, persist and go ahead and, and do that. And we can see that activity has now been scheduled. Um, but that warning that was created is automatically uh, persist on the record for us. And if we just come out of here for a second, minimize these forms down and go back to our, our main view, we can see here in the change schedule calendar that we can view a number of different things. So we can look at um, change requests and request activities as a whole. And that, those uh, activities that we've just defined, the pre-production testing will be available here with drill down capabilities. I could look at specific changes. I could look at changes sat with particular teams. I may only be interested in um, change activity or release activity or change proposal activity or you know, all the projected uh, service outage information. Or I might want to look at my changes but only actually have a look at um, uh, change or request activity. So I might want to have a look at everything that's currently in uh, or scheduled in a testing phase and I can see that information again at the bottom. And I might want to look at that uh, daily, weekly or monthly. But if we come back up and we'll, uh, we'll go back into that uh, ticket that we were in a second ago and we can now see that we can drill in and look at the information. Now a lot of organisations work in different ways when it comes to change and release. Um, Support Works certainly has a, a formalised uh, release uh, mechanism where we can uh, amalgamate multiple changes into a single release package. Um, we can invoke conditions and rules where that change has to be in a ready for release status um, before that, uh, that change can be associated to a release. But some, uh, some organisations um, uh, don't need that level of, of granularity or uh, onto that particular maturity level and want to uh, contain release within the actual change request. And again, that's really just uh, defined within your business process that underpins that. So again, it's really entirely up to you as how that works. The key thing really though is, you know, wherever we start, as, as we did from an instant to a, a problem, to an own error, to a change, to a, a release, we can cascade up, but we can also cascade down. So if we took the example where we'd worked this one through and we were you know, successfully uh, deploying this, this change or this release, as long as we have this tick box selected, all of those actions, including the text, status changes, can automatically be deployed down. So we can auto-close, auto-resolve all of those child tickets that were related to this particular change within one, one action. And if we look in the associated information, the... Uh, known error that we promoted this change from is there, but also the, the incidents that, um, that that originated this are also on here as well. But interestingly as well, we can also start to record effective change. So in that, this example where we may have uh, deployed this change into our environment, and then over the, over the subsequent number of days, we may have started receiving incidents or problems uh, to the service desk that could have been triggered as a result of that change. So we can come back maybe within our review stage of that change and start to look at actually, well, what did we do well? What did we do badly? Uh, why did we get all of these uh, issues um, off the back of this change? So again, entirely up to you um, how that may uh, may work in your environment. Okay, so we'll just um, change, uh, close some of those forms down. Um, it may be an appropriate point to, to switch context and actually have a look at uh, what's an end user's view um, of support works um, and, and how do they interact. So we'll just go off to the support works self-service portal and we'll log in as uh, an end user. Now I'm logging in here. Um, SupportWorks does support uh, single sign-on, so your users could bypass the uh, the login page completely. Uh, it is just well just a series of uh, cascading style sheets. So in terms of um, branding this, then you can come in and make you know simple changes to the to the logos. Um, and obviously for those that have got the skills and um, are familiar with CSS um, forms they can come in and, and, and change a lot more uh, on here if required. But anyway, I'm logged in as Anna, uh, and just to give you a quick tour of what we're looking at here, Anna's logged in. Anna uses a number of services, 
and those services we've defined, decided to, to publish out their availability status so we can see here which ones are, are faulty and are, are currently running without issue. So, so maybe before I actually uh, log a, a ticket against that service I can obviously see what the item is and any message and information that's been published out for me. I can also know if there's any problems or, or changes that might be affecting me that are published here. I can see the last five tickets that I've logged that are available in the system. And I've also then got access across sort of four key areas. I've got access to, to knowledge. Um, I can look at my existing tickets. I can raise simple requests or I can have a look at the services that I'm entitled to, to, to consume and, and raise requests against. But if we start by having a look at the, the knowledge base, um, I can come in here and have a look at any knowledge that's been marked as being uh, externally uh, facing. We can mark all articles as just being accessible to the, the service team and keep those in-house uh, as needed. We can create different uh, knowledge catalogues. We can have knowledge life cycles to, to give our analysts the ability to, to publish knowledge articles but not have the, uh, sorry, uh, create knowledge articles but not have the rights to publish. We might have to go through an approval stage before they get published. And as I say, we can then mark those, um, those articles as being um, publicly searchable or not. I could do a search here though against the keywords, the title or any of the, the text that's contained within these documents and it's going to return for me um, a series of relevance uh, results. So I can see here a couple of articles that are uh, scored quite highly in terms of relevance on the search terms that I've used. And if we have a look at this example here, we can see that um, a knowledge article can actually be made up of a number of different things. It could be simple text, it could be embedded videos or links or PDFs. It's entirely up to you how you want to sort of populate the content. It can also be um, a case of indexing external documents as well, so they're accessible uh, through the knowledge uh, uh, function as well. So we can give the ability for our users to you know, watch knowledge. People tend to like uh, watching videos rather than uh, having to read big manuals these days. But what we can also ask our users for is some feedback on the, the relevance of that, of that knowledge article to them. And, you know, did it resolve their issue? So we know who's going to have looked at these articles automatically, but we're interested in, you know, was it relevant? Uh, did it fix the issue? Does the article need to be modified? Those types of questions and all of that information can be submitted both by the, your customers, but also by your analysts that are providing the support as well. If that doesn't um, help us, we can obviously move on and, and log a new request directly from that search um, um, option as well. And we can, if, if appropriate, relate articles to one another so that if you are searching for a particular on a particular search string and it isn't doesn't give you the article that you're looking for in the background we can say okay well maybe try these ones as well which uh, again sort of saves me from having to uh, put in different search criteria but if we come back up to the home page we can look at those other options that are available to us so within my requests i can look at my existing tickets that i've, I've logged um, i can search against them based on you know um, a particular text against you know the reference the type the summary the details uh, I can just look at incidents I can see the ratings that I provided so Sportworks is provided with a, um, uh, a customer satisfaction survey which you can fire on the resolution of, of tickets but what we also provide you with here is the ability for you to prompt your users to give live feedback in terms of how they're feeling about the level of support at the time that that support is being provided so that allows your customers to say I'm feeling you know happy or unhappy and it gives your support, your analysts, the ability to say, OK, well, there's an issue here, rather than waiting a month or two months until that ticket's resolved and then asking for feedback, at which point it's probably too late to do anything about it. So this gives you the ability to react to it during the life cycle of the tickets. If we uh, go along and look at the, the most recent ones, these could be you know, new starter requests that have been created or uh, issues that you've had. And I can look at these requests. Um, I can look at them. I can see the, the summary details. I can see which team they've been attributed to, any relevant SLA information. I can also see as a consumer of that particular request where that request sits when it's um, its ticket life cycle. So at the moment this one is sat there because it requires approval before um, that anything has happened. Um, and also is that when I'm looking at a request I might want to provide an update so I can put in text, I can add file attachments, I can escalate it or if uh, appropriate I can cancel that, um, that request if it's, if it's no longer needed. And I've also got access to the call diary, which just gives me access to all the information that's been marked as publicly accessible in here. Okay. Coming back out again, and then we're looking at sort of how do I, as a, a consumer, actually log requests into the system. Well, there's two ways to do that. The first of which is very sort of much the traditional help desk approach, which is where we might say to the user, okay, we'll have a go at categorizing it. Um, uh, let's just put it again. Won't start. Won't. won't. 
and we can submit that through. Now, that's quick and easy, and it gets that ticket, and we can, we can route that to a particular team. But the first thing I probably have to do there as the, um, the support team that's received that is actually ring them straight back and go, well, what do you mean by that? What information, you know, I need more information from you to be able to proceed and help you resolve that issue. So what we've moved towards is the concept of a, a sort of service uh, catalogue. So within here, you know, the business or the IT will have defined a, a service structure. Uh, and within that, you'll have defined what your services are. Uh, and then decide which of those um, services the particular users in your organization or customers are entitled to make service requests against. And this user, Anna, actually has the, the rights to raise service requests or ask for support against a number of those services. Um, but what is presented is just the ones that she's entitled to use, not everything that you offer. So that could be, you know, the fact that she might want to raise support against uh, email. It might be that she's having an issue with particular applications that you provide. Um, and from here, Anna might actually say, okay, well, I need support against that, that, um, that particular application. And this example for, uh, for Office, it might be an Excel or it might be an Outlook issue. So what sits behind these um, are self-service wizards that you can create yourself. So again, decision tree based wizards that allow you to, to not only capture the relevant information, but based on the answers that are being provided, that information um, can be used to um, decide where this ticket gets routed, what SLA should be used. All that information will be based on the, the, the decisions or the selections that the user is making. It's always a balancing act between asking uh, enough to allow you to do something with the answers that have been provided and, and, and perhaps asking too much so that people don't want to use this and, and, and feel it's sort of over, overbearing and the onus is on them very much. So again, so it's a bit of a, uh, a learning curve to sort of go through on here. But again, it can be nice and straightforward. We can provide information um, on here, no emails. Coming through. On to next, and we can submit that uh, into the system. Again, confirmation that the, the ticket's been logged, 1276. And if I go back to my home page, I can see here that that was the last issue that I've, I've raised as well. But it doesn't just have to be support-related issues. It could be um, requests for um, things. It could be, for example, I'd like a, a new BlackBerry or a new iPhone or I need a new laptop. Or it could be that um, heads of department have the ability to initiate new starter requests or lever processes or report um, sickness absences that get routed to a, a particular HR team, whatever it might be, it's entirely up to you. What you can do on here is actually define what that service means. So as somebody that has the rights to raise requests against that service, what's that service actually going to um, provide me with? So if we take this example uh, from a service request perspective and we'll raise a new starter request. Again, it's going to follow um, um, a self-service wizard that you will have created. And we'll just use my details here. And put them in. The mandatory fields are the ones denoted in, in red. Um, and we're going to put here joining the manager in the pre sales team and might be joining as a consultant. We can optionally make cost information available to the person raising these requests if it's pertinent. So, you know, this is what it's costing the business every time that you make a request of this particular type. And we can see here that there are some variable, option, variable options, and we'll come on to those in a second. We can have decision tree based questions. So it could be actually this, this user's joining on a, on a contract basis and they're joining us between these dates um, or they're joining us on a permanent basis um, and they start on, you know, maybe tomorrow and they will be located at a particular site, which is a database lookup for you and they're going to report into a particular person. Um, we may also have a, a package of standard uh, application services or, you know, equipment CIs that they're going to be provided as a, as a standard starter to the, to the business. But there might be some variables to that. So they might get the standard applications, but for their particular role, they might need uh, access to the Sage County package, or they might need a manager's access to a particular solution, or they might want to request an iPhone. doesn't necessarily mean they're going to get it, but they can certainly make the request for it. So on here, we can see that as we're adding optional extras in here, the estimated total is increasing. The cost of a request can also be used by that business process as a, um, a condition against which it could say, okay, well, if it goes over a particular budget threshold, it now needs to go to an extra level of authorization, just as an example. So you can use all these parameters um, to underpin your business logic. But we've got some examples there, so we'll go on. It might be for those ones where you've got multiple um, stages to those requests that you might want to give them a summary sheet before they submit. You might have asked a lot of questions to make sure that's correct. And then that ticket is logged into the system. So we, can, we know at this point that a service request has been raised and it's ticket 1277. If we go back to the service uh, service desk now and look at um, look at that ticket, so we might want to do a, a search for that service request one two seven seven, and we can look at that as coming as a service request. 
We can see all the information that was provided by Anna in terms of the, the wizard input is available to me. An underlying business process has automatically been invoked and it's requiring Anna's manager to make that approval before we actually do anything with this ticket. But I can see here price information, the components that are required, everything that's needed. But ultimately, I'm probably going to do nothing with that until it's actually been authorised. So the question is, do I even need to see it? And that's entirely up to you. And we'll look at your service desk view at the moment because it's just really filtered uh, views of the tickets that you know, that you work with. And you can obviously uh, filter out ones that you don't need to see until they're appropriate, i.e. authorised. So in the background, that business process will have sent an email off to Anna's manager saying you've got something to authorise and Anna's manager can go to a number of places, the mobile client, self-service or via email to, to make that decision. So we'll just come back to self-service and log in as Anna's manager. And we get a similar view to what Anna had, apart from as a manager I might have some extra options. So I might not, might not be limited just seeing my own requests, I might have the rights to see requests that have been logged against my site or my organization or members of my team. Um, but I've also got the option or the notification here that there's some pending authorization decisions that need to be made. So we'll click on that notification and that last request we logged here, 1277, is available for us to review. So I can see all of the information that was uh, originally submitted, the component parts that have been requested. I can see where that's sitting in the business process. But ultimately, I'm going to come down and have a look at what I'm actually being um, asked to authorize. So on here, I can see what I'm being asked to approve, uh, the costs that are attributed to it, any of those optional components, and I can come in here and make my decision, you know, approve, reject, or maybe pass it up the tree if I want someone else in, a, in higher authority to make that decision. My decision that I make is then uh, defined and confirmed. And if we have a look at our business process now, we can see that it's now moved on to uh, an authorized state. And if we come back to the service request in Sportworks, we can see it's now been authorized and we have actually moved into another stage of that process, which might be actually the provisioning of this service request. So nice, nice and automated and quick for you and easy to use. I hope, uh, hope you'll all agree. Um, in this example, though, when we earlier looked at a change request, all of our uh, tasks appeared concurrently. But this is an example where this is slightly different. So the first thing we might need to do for this new starter is actually configure their equipment and maybe set them up on Active Directory. But if I go ahead and say, okay, well, this task has been um, passed out to another team and they've come in and they've, uh, they've set this user up on Active Directory, I can confirm that I've done that. Fantastic, that one's been, that's been completed. And as a result of that one being completed, the, a new task has been created, which is set up their email account, even though I haven't yet um, uh, configured their equipment. So we can have separate streams existing of tasks within each of these stages, within each of the processes that we've that we've defined as well. So we'll go through and we'll complete that uh, email task. And we can see here another task has appeared, which is security pass for London. So what this allows us to do is actually um, set conditional tasks as well, tasks that will only appear based on conditions being met. And in this example, this task only appeared because the new starter was joining the London office. If they were joining the Northampton office, there is no need for a security fob to get into the building. Therefore, that task is irrelevant and redundant and, and we don't need to don't need to use that. So all of that is built into the, the underlying business processes for us. Okay. So this, this process could go on uh, more stages, more tasks, more authorizations until we've completed. And we may, we may um, create a, an authorization back to the customer to say, are you happy? Has it been delivered? All of that. Well, that's all built in there. But um, we'll leave that service request at that particular point and come back in and actually have a look at the, the underlying business process that we were following there. So we we'll go to our uh, business process design and we can have a look at the processes that might be in, invoked against our different uh, uh, different ITIL uh, processes. But we'll take that new starter process here. So this one, it came in, um, it needed to be authorised. So if we come in and have a look at that authorization decision, that node here, it was the customer's manager that we defined um, as being the authoriser. It could have, as I mentioned earlier, it could have been um, a whole number of different uh, approvers. It could have been an effective business owner, service owner, convict owner, etc., etc. Or based on a number of conditions, it could have been a different set of people. So we can build all that logic into the into the process. But once it was authorised and we moved forward, we came on to the IT uh, new starter setup. And if we have a look at those, um, we look at the, the stage, and we have a look at the tasks that appeared. The first two that we saw were configure equipment and set them up an active directory. But we can see here the other tasks were either set as uh, predecessors and were reliant on these tasks being completed before they appeared 
and or a conditional task of a uh, conditional rule have been set for this task to say only appear after this particular task and only if the um, site to which the person is joining um, meets that condition, which is London. So these business processes um, can be viewed graphically, built graphically, um, um, and give you lots and lots of power and control in terms of how you want to work. The other view that we wanted to have a look at really was then actually, okay, well, we've, we've worked with a lot of tickets. We've raised instance changes, problems, service requests, and seen that from a variety of different views. But in terms of working with all those tickets coming in, the main place we're going to do that from, uh, from an analyst perspective is actually the, the service desk view. And on here on the left hand side, we can actually see your team structure represented. So you can have teams and you can have teams within teams. You can have individuals that work for multiple teams. Um, we can see who's logged in again, denoted by the, uh, the blue color and, and those that are not. On the right hand side is just a view um, and is in context of what you are on the left hand side. So if I wanted to look at Gary's team, as I, uh, Gary's Q and I had the rights to do so, I can click on that and the right hand side moves in context. If I wanted to look at a team view, I could. And again, if I wanted to look at everything in the desk as a whole, then I have the rights to do that as well. What you see on the right hand side is entirely up to you, whether you use one or two levels, whether you've got multiple tabs or a single tab. It's entirely up to you. I've just split those out by the different um, ITIL processes that we support and made those available here. You can create uh, filters. So look at just my active calls, those are on hold or off hold. You've got control over which of the columns are displayed, uh, the order they're displayed in. The escalation uh, arrows denote really your underlying SLAs and your, um, your movement towards the response or fix time. So maybe you can use that as a way to uh, prioritize your work. You can see which tickets have been updated. So when a customer updates via email or the self-service portal, you can see that there's a new update to your ticket. Ticket information, business process stages, etc. All of that information is entirely up to you. Tickets can be set with individuals or the team, and that's denoted by the icons of one or, or multiples. Um, and there's a number of right-click options which are available to you as well to support how you work within this service desk view. So on here, I could come in and just you know choose to update the call that I've got highlighted or accept it, or I could come back up and select multiple calls and say, actually, I want to apply that same update across all those tickets. And I want each of those cus uh, customers to be emailed individually. Um, and the update is as follows. And again, using that multi um, clip that we had before, I need these log files from, from all of you relating to those tickets. So we apply those updates and we can then see here that the emails go off to the individual customers for that particular request and all personalized email. Other options I've got available to me uh, on here is the ability to obviously cancel multiple calls. I may want to, to preview the calls that I'm working on uh, before I actually have to open them up. And my preview option could be the last update or the original description or my personal preference is actually keeping that list more uh, concise and consinct uh, on there for us. But as well as thinking about your internal um, teams, we also here can define the third party suppliers that we work with and those third party contracts that we have with those suppliers that underpin potentially the services that we provide to, um, to our customers. So in here we can see some of the suppliers that we may have set up and we can open up a, a record in this example for, for BT. And we might have all the classic information, who they are, account manager, postal address, but we might have several contracts with that particular uh, supplier and each of those contracts might offer us different levels of service. So if we drill down further into this, this particular contract might cover particular CIs or services. We'll have an audit trail of any changes that have been made. We might also have a record of any tickets that have been passed to that third party during the life of that, uh, that contract. We can look at that contract's validity dates and obviously get reminders when that expires. The support hours that they provide support against, but also what are the SLAs or underpinning contracts that we're paying for um, with those third parties so that we can build all this in here and we can also manage them. So when we pass a ticket across to the third party, we can build in our own escalation triggers to say, well, actually, if they haven't got back to us within a certain period of time, we want that ticket to increase in terms of its escalation arrows, or we want to bring it back in and we'll, we'll follow up with them because they haven't responded to us. All of that is there. But by having this information and recording this information, when the renewal comes up for that you know, support contract which you're paying for, you can actually then start to assess their performance against the, uh, the SLA that they're providing to you um, when it comes to discussing the renewal fees, etc. So all of that information uh, is available and accessible to you. Okay. So 
we've looked at quite a lot there, and I'm, I'm, I certainly haven't got time um, or keep, want to keep you all day on this. So um, I'm just going to look at a couple of the other key areas before we move on to the reporting um, side of this for you. So we've looked here in the context of the Windows client primarily. So I'm just going to go back to um, my browser, and I'm just going to go to the web client, uh, which is available as well for you as a, an analyst. And we'll have a look at this, and we'll log in. Uh, as a, as a user. Key reason for the, doing this, it's, it's really up to you which interface um, you want to use, whether you're comfortable with the Windows client or the web client. There is a difference in terms of functionality. The, the main difference um, is around the administrative function, so um, creating security profiles and managing categories and such like is all controlled within the, the Windows client. Uh, but from the, the web client, I still have access to, to manage my data in terms of my uh, accessing my CMDB, my CIs, setting up my, my configuration types, uh, my services, my service categories and defining all, all of those. All of that information is still accessible to me. The, the Windows client and the web client actually share the same code base. So what that basically means is the look and feel is going to be very, very similar to, to what you've experienced through the, um, the Windows client on here. Um, so if we had a look at, um, for example, the new uh, log instant form, this form is going to look pretty much the same as what we what we saw in the Windows client. Key thing is if, if we make, want to make changes to how these forms appear, we can do that in the Windows uh, client using um, the application form designer. And those form changes, you know, adding a field, removing a field, colors, etc., etc., will all be reflected in the web client automatically for me. So I don't have to, to, to manage two different interfaces. That can all be done for me. But all the other options that we looked at in terms of, you know, business process design, access to... Uh, dashboard and trending and such like all of that uh, information is is accessible to me through uh, the web client as well the analysts also have a mobile uh, interface that's available to them so we we'll just take a, a quick uh, look at that for you as well and we'll log in here it's oh, get my login credentials correct So the, the mobile client is just a cut down sort of um, a web client uh, which is supported pretty much on, on, on most devices that support HTML5, certainly the, the iOS and, um, uh, and BlackBerry sort of RIM uh, browsers are, are certainly have, have no issue there. Um, in terms of access from the, the mobile client from a, an analyst perspective, and I've got access to my requests, I can log new requests, search for specific ones look at the, the instance that are attributed to my team or me. I can see the escalation arrows reflected in the same way as the, uh, on the service desk view here. I can drill into tickets. I can look at the original details. I can update, accept, assign, cancel, view the, the history, the customer information. All, that, all of that data or data is available to me. Um, I can also look at my tasks. I can make authorization decisions. I can search the customer uh, database. I can search the CMDB and I've got access to um, some sort of top level uh, reports on my on my mobile client as well in terms of the breakdown of tickets that are, are open and attributed to my team as well as SLA performances and, and instance affecting services. So there's a number of features and functions that um, are available to me here um, as well. But coming back in and, and sort of looking at um, what we can do with the data that once we've you know, we've, we've created it, we've brought our users in, our CIs, we're logging tickets, we've got our services defined, we've got all of that information, how do we get that information out? Well, there's lots of ways um, to get data out of, um, of SupportWorks, and I'll, I'll try and sort of take it up in, in, in stages for you. So initially, and going right back to the first screen that we looked at here, we've got the SupportWorks Today page, and, and this gives us some sort of, sort of global uh, metrics, and it gives us our, our um, key performance indicators sort of globally on here, and I might want to drill into a, a, a uh, chart there and that's going to give me a list and I can look at that list and I can sort it and work with it but I can also right click on that and decide to export that out and I can export it out in a variety of formats so XML, HTML, Excel, CSV etc. And that is true of uh, any list or search that you're on so from here you've got the ability to export data out in exactly the same way so it's entirely up to you um, how you work with that. But then we sort of move on and say we've got the search options so we can find information in that way and we can have free text search and, and multiple parameter searches. But then we come on to our sort of, um, uh, if you like, out-of-the-box reporting uh, options that are available for you here. So we ship with roughly about 300 or so um, system reports. Um, and 
that, that includes a variety of you know date based ones and ones covering all the different ITIL processes that we support. But if we just have a look at um, some of these sample reports on here, um, let's just take so look at some of our customer reports. You know, open calls by customer, for example. So a simple report here where you know we can look at all the tickets that aren't closed that have been logged by particular people. We see here Anna's obviously logged a lot of tickets with us, and we can see below it's broken down by each of those individuals. Now that's great, um, but there's a number of um, um, things that we can do with these reports. Well, first of all, is we might want to put some parameters around it, date parameters, such like, or we might have wanted to actually schedule this report so it can be sent to us on a on a recurring basis, and that might have been emailed to us or pushed to a network location, FTP, etc., and, and run on a or once only or once a day on these particular days all of that can be set up or i might want to use that uh, report as a template and i'm going to create a copy of it and edit it and, and change the parameters or i might actually want to have a look at what what actually was the construction of that report how how did we get to that point where that data was visible to us so it's really looking at these reports and saying okay well it's looking at one or multiple database tables and i can do my joins um, on those tables i can then say okay well if they the tables that we want to report against what information do we want to include in the reports and we can do that in, in a user-friendly name or, or otherwise. And we see here that we've got a number of parameters. And I can literally just include or remove the, uh, the columns as needed. For those um, that want to put uh, filters against these reports, and you can certainly do that. And if you're familiar with SQL, you can come in and just write those SQL statements as, uh, as you need them. Alternatively, if you wanted to add a new clause in, there is a clause builder at the bottom that will actually build that for you. So you can create your is equal to, begins with, contains is one of, all of those and that statement will be returned to you. So you certainly don't need to know SQL inside out to be able to use this facility. But then you move on to actually, well, how do I want that information presented? So at the moment, it's looking at it by the, the customer, but I could switch that around with the same data set and say, actually, I'm more interested in which support teams are looking at that data. And I might want my graph to reflect that. And then I might want my subgraph, which is shown here, to, to be looking at that in terms of within those teams, uh, which are the analysts that are responsible for those tickets. So we can make those changes and then rerun that report again. So we've got the same data, but we're now looking at it in terms of the support teams. And we can see here within the first line team that these these tickets within that first line team are currently, if you like, unassigned. But um, these, these analysts have actually got these tickets attributed and associated to them. And from here, I might want to drill down into the underlying tickets um, it's entirely up to you what we do with that data. So I say there's a there's a whole tranche of system reports which are provided out of the out of the box for you. But there's also a set of uh, item aligned reports that looks at, look at the specific um, areas. And these are these are custom HTML reports. And for instance, for example, they're looking at first time uh, fixed rates, trending information, uh, oldest incidents um, that are logged in the system with a you know number of parameters that we could choose and. Crikey, there's some very, very old uh, tickets in this system. Uh, or hopefully that wouldn't be the case in your in your live ones. But that goes through and we can look at the same for changes and problems and, and services. And we can look at um, you know, service level agreement monitoring, for example. So we might want to have a look at um, availability. So of these, uh, you know, the SLAs that are offering. So where these SLAs are being used across multiple services that we offer. And we take today, take the change management example for us. We can actually graphically now look and say, okay, well, um, we might have set some thresholds to say, well, uh, if the service is not available for X hours in a defined period, I'm interested. So that's, you know, it hasn't means we've breached our SLA, but it's in that in interme intermediate area. So we can see here uh, during the month of May, there's been one hour of, um, of downtime against that particular service for that SLA. Whereas on these other ones, we've actually um, hit our, uh, availability uh, obligations against those services for those and obviously any that exceeded the targets you set would appear in red um, and give you visibility of that across all the different services that you offer so there's a number of different ways to get reports in and out using um, custom reports and system reports the next um, level that we can take that up to is actually looking at this from a uh, a role-based dashboard perspective so support work ships with a um, <clears throat> A trending engine that can underpin the metrics that have been provided onto these dashboards but the the tool itself allows you to actually create and define as many dashboards um, as you need and you can set up these these groups and dashboards here with the appropriate rights and then you can attribute to in to groups of dashboards so this service desk might have a change incident problem dashboard attributed to it so i could come into that and say actually these users or these roles have rights to view this dashboard when they're logged in or 
when someone's logged in within that group, they have only got the rights to look at the incident management dashboard that's contained within there. But once we've got our rights and, and dashboard set up, it's about then creating the measures uh, and charts and widgets that we want to include on those dashboards. So right down at the, the bottom level, we can come in here and say, okay, well, I'm interested in looking at, you know, calls log per day, and I want to look at this hourly, daily, weekly, whatever those parameters may be. And we can set that and we can then um, kick off those measures being taken. And those measures will then be set against a target that you've defined. And we can see that in sort of spike, line, uh, spike chart line format in terms of how we're doing against that target. We can color code how we're doing against that target, depending on whether being above the target is a good or a bad thing. But once we've got those measures set up, we can then go in and start looking at the specific widgets that we want to uh, present onto these dashboards and make available. So these could include um, charts. You know, you might have, uh, it might be creating que uh, queries for, you know, which your analysts are actually raising changes. And we can drill down and have a look at the underlying data and say, okay, well, I want to look at the top 10 and I want to look at, you know, um, tickets that are being logged that are change requests and that but haven't been logged by self-service. And once I've got that information, I want it to be a, a 2D chart. Um, and this is what it's going to look like before I decide whether I want to use that or not. I might want to come in and start creating my own scorecards. And, and scorecards can be a, a combination of measures. So rather than just having individual measures, we can have little scorecards that are being presented which contain multiple measures. So if we have a look at here, we can see that this has got one measure on it. I might want to come in and add uh, additional ones by, by simply double clicking and bringing those down and equally removing them away. So once we've got those, we might also complement them by creating custom uh, custom queries using um, underlying PHP scripts. Again, that is just giving the more advanced users that want to get a little bit more clever uh, with the data set, they've got the ability to come in uh, and create those. But once we've got those three sets of parameters defined, we can come back up to our dashboards and actually say, well, for this particular dashboard, I want to include these charts, I want to include these scorecards, and I want to include these particular custom measures. So it's really, really granular in terms of how we want that to, to be defined. Um, what order these things are presented in is entirely up to you. Then as a consumer of one of those dashboards, depending on my rights and permissions, when I come in and view them, I'm going to see the information that's available to me. I'm going to see uh, custom uh, queries in terms of the uh, this one major instance and the ability to drill down. I've also got, if we come up to uh, the instant one on here, for example, the ability to download the data as a, in CSV format, or I might want to actually un uh, drill down into the underlying information. It's entirely up to me what I want to, to do with that. The, the dashboards are also available uh, for a browser as well. So if you wanted to actually display this on a, on a large screen, uh, then you can do so. I do have to log in um, as a, an account that has the rights to use the dashboard so that it can pick up on the appropriate dashboards that are um, that I have the rights to, to see. So here I've got the rights to look at um, service desk view and also I've got the rights to look at maybe the problem management dashboard and I want this to be refreshing on a, on a, on a minute basis. So I can set all of that up within my browser and maybe then push that up onto, uh, onto a big screen. Um, as I am logged in as a, an analyst to this, then I am connected to the, uh, the server, therefore I'm consuming a license. That's always a consideration when you're looking at publishing these, these out. Obviously, if I'm an analyst and I'm logged in, I'm already using a license to be in the, um, in the interface anyway. So the last option really in terms of reporting over and above that is that we do provide um, SportWorks with an ODBC driver, which will allow you to query the data from any third party reporting tool um, and to assist you in understanding the the data set then we do provide you with the um, we do provide you with a schema report that will allow you to uh, analyze all of that information um, that's available to you um, in terms of the relationships between the, the tables okay at this point um, we've covered off quite a lot and I've, I've taken a lot of your of, of your time hopefully you found the uh, session useful uh, if you do have any questions um, as a follow-up to this then please do speak to your uh, relationship manager or your sales manager um, and I hope you found the session useful.